Good morning, everybody. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Leif, and I have the privilege again today of being part of the worship team. You know, as I was preparing for this morning, uh, I was thinking about how as we gather like we are this morning in front of our computers, in front of our television sets, in our family rooms, in our living rooms, so often we're gathering to watch something, right? Something educational, maybe sports, some entertainment, a movie, what have you. But this morning, as we gather, we don't come together to watch something, right? We've come together to participate with the family of God here in the North Hills of Pittsburgh to worship Him, to learn from Him. And so I just want to encourage you, let's lean in and let's worship God together this morning. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, 
We're going to continue talking about the Beatitudes this morning. You may remember that the Beatitudes tell us what our attitude should be. The first Beatitude taught us that being poor in spirit means that our worth comes from God, not from our own abilities. In the second Beatitude, we discovered that the kind of mourning Jesus meant was this deep, heart-sick sort of sadness over our sins. And the third Beatitude, the one we're talking about today, is blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, meek is a really little word, but it has a huge meaning. Most people don't really understand what Jesus meant by the word meek. And the world tells us that it isn't a good thing to be meek. They think meek means weak, but the word meek is actually pretty cool. Today, we're adding a tomato to our burger, and tomato can be a fragile fruit, especially if they're ripe, right? So imagine that we are trying to pick up this tomato with a set of tongs. If I use too much pressure on my tomato, I can damage the tomato or break it. On the other hand, if I don't use enough, it'll just fall right to the counter. 
I have to use the perfect amount of strength under control in order to safely pick up my tomato. Here's another example. A gentle breeze doesn't lose its power to move a boat just because we call it gentle. And we often refer to horses as gentle, but they are so strong that they can kick a hole in the side of a barn. So when Jesus says Christians are meek, he's not saying they're weak. He doesn't mean you should allow someone to be unkind or hurtful to you or to not stand up for yourself. It's all in your approach. Our best chance of having strength under control is to simply let God take the lead in our lives. Meek people trust in the Lord because they know that God's ways are the best ways. It's not a me attitude, it's a be attitude. Go ahead and add your tomato to your Beatitude burger and your third Beatitude, and we'll talk more next week. My mom's name was Ruth, and one thing she was very good at was listening to our problems. She was best at just loving us. Always made you feel good to be home. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. We, we, we love, love you. you. You give the best hugs. And make the best cookies. The characteristic I appreciate or value in my mom is her ability to make everyone feel welcome and cared for and part of a family. She's caring and she always looks out for us and she always loves us. Um, she is helpful because she's getting us through this hard time with the quarantine. My mom is silly and funny. Uh, she makes me laugh. And I can talk to her on any subject. She's always on my side. And she gives me free advice, which means she's okay if I don't take it. I would say the best way to describe my mom, Jill, would be selflessness. Um, I think she completely embodies that quality. And every day I see that everyone else's agenda comes before hers. And it doesn't seem to bother her at all if it's just we don't know. Um, but I just think that the way that she cares for other people and um, puts them above herself is just amazing. Hi, Mom. Thank you for going to work and making us breakfast, lunch, dinner, and helping us with our schoolwork and helping us um, get ready for the day. And thank you for going out with James to the stores and stuff. Thank you. Bye, Mom. My mom is generous, treating her 10-person family to getaways, and she's also pretty good with a shovel. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Our mom liked to have fun. My mom was very selfless and enjoyed life. Thank you, Mom, for going to work and getting money and risking your life for all of us. And I love you. You're the best mom in the world. I really admire in my mom and my mother-in-law and my grandmas their resiliency and their resourcefulness. They are, they've turned motherhood into an art form and I've been emulating them for 11 years. I love them. My mom's selflessness and how much she cares for others is what I admire most about her. Hi, Jana. Love you. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you for everything you do. Make us lunch, make us dinner, make us breakfast. Thank you. Happy Mother's Day. My mom, Wanda, in Columbus, Ohio, turns 90 this summer. And I'm thankful that she's still so in tune with the Lord, and I know she definitely will make it to heaven one day. Every time I hear, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God, I remember my mom was the peacemaker of the family. Thank you, Jenna, for being the best mom. Uh, I love you. One thing I appreciate about my mom is her strong work ethic. She always gives 110%, making sure the job is done just right. By the way, if any cookie doesn't look perfect on Sunday, it gets pulled from the tray. Hi, I'm Christy Babinsack. I'm Jill Hickenbottom's daughter. The most important trait that I got from my grandma, my mom's mom, is my faith in God. She was one of the first people to take me to church and she taught me all about God. The most important trait that I got from my mom is the importance of family. Our family has been through a lot, but we always stick together. And my husband and I are raising our seven children with the same philosophy. Happy Mother's Day! Mom, I love you because you play Fortnite with me and you make the best dinners. Happy Mother's Day. My mom is amazing because she doesn't like chocolate, so I always get all of it and I don't have to share. 
no, really. Um, she is just so helpful with everyone and doesn't tell anyone what she's doing because it's just who she is. And she has helped so many people and it's very inspiring. I appreciate that my mom is willing to admit when she makes mistakes. I appreciate that my mom shows affection directly and indirectly from a hug to helping us clean our room. I appreciate that my mom perseveres and that she doesn't quit with whatever she's doing. I've always appreciated my mom's resourcefulness. Growing up, if there was something that she thought was important for us to do or something to have, she'd find a way to make it happen. Good morning, welcome. Happy Mother's Day to everyone out there. Those are some great videos, great clips. Thank you so much for those of you that submitted those. There's so much that we can learn, so much that has been modeled for us, that are those valuable attributes and qualities from our moms that have been invested into us. So good stuff, thanks to those of you that participated and submitted video clips. When I think of my mom, um, I think about how she repeatedly put the comfort and the welfare of her kids ahead of her own. And that's maybe a common, common observation we see a lot. It's kind of natural, but that's very notable to me. I remember a hike. My sister and I were very young, and I remember we were hiking with my mom, and we were kind of crossing this lazy stream, and there was an old tree that had fallen, kind of an old log. And as we passed, I guess we disturbed a, a bee's nest. Um, and I remember that my mom, she kind of encountered it, and I just have this, this sight of her yelling at the two of us to just run, just go, as she's kind of hovering nearby and kind of taking all the stings so that the bees wouldn't run after us. We are running, and she waited until we were far enough away, and then she finally took off out of there, having been stung so many times. I remember that image of my mom putting the welfare of her children above herself, and that was really notable to me. I remember that. Oddly enough, that, um, that scene would be repeated with my own kids in a pretty different way, though. Um, we had a dog named Lydia many years ago. Maybe you old-timers here might remember her from, from those years back. When our kids were really little, she kind of was always trying to protect them, always trying to mother them. She, she had this sense that they were just babies, and so she needed to kind of protect them. Well, we were in our backyard, and uh, someone disturbed a ground bee nest. Now, ground bees are nasty. But they started dive bombing my kids, these little toddlers that can barely walk and run. And Lydia somehow sensed that. She spotted where the nest was, she jumped on it. She started barking at it, and she was just pelted by these ground bees that, that took all their anger out on her. And I remember hearing her barking and yelping repeatedly in pain, but she wouldn't move. She was protecting those little babies. And thank goodness, because it was a nice summer morning and I didn't want to have to set down my coffee. I think um, when that episode of the dog and the bee's nest went down, Debbie was kind of in, in triage mode. She, see, Milla had gotten stung in the ear and, and was screaming and holding her ear, trapping a bee inside who kept stinging the ear. And Debbie had the job of trying to pry that fierce little hand off of the ear to get the bee out. She was doing that kind of stuff. But one of the traits I value most about Debbie, my kid's mom, is her perseverance in the things that she's committed to. No one will probably ever know the work that Debbie had to put in for getting three little people ready for church every Sunday. I, I was the worship leader at a church for many years, a portable church that met at a, at a movie theater at one point in time, and my Sunday morning alarm went off at about 4.30. And there was one morning, one scene Debbie could tell you about. Um, while I was already at the space at the movie theater helping to get the, the portable worship space set up and running sound checks and all the things I would do, Debbie was simply trying to get the three newly walking toddlers from the car that she had just parked through the parking lot and through the doors. But she could only hold two hands at a time and then one would go rogue. So you have one mom holding the hands of two little people together, running after one escapee, finally catching up to the runaway and then another one breaks free. I think she said that one morning it took her over 20 minutes just to get those 20 feet in the door. That's perseverance. So anyway, happy Mother's Day this morning. We've had so many valuable attributes modeled for us by our mothers. And this morning on Mother's Day, we're continuing in our message series, This End Up, spending time looking at the greatest sermon ever given, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus took the standard issue accepted human ways of thinking and finding meaning, and he turned it on its head, and he said, here's a better way, this end up. Jesus shows us in the Sermon on the Mount about living in such a way 
is to help bring God's up there kingdom down here. And we've been seeing the, the, the repeated use of the word blessed in this opening section called the Beatitudes. And blessed here referring to, to lasting happiness, the good life found in these, in these states that Jesus describes. Oh, the joy of the poor in spirit. That was the first beatitude we looked at a couple of weeks ago. And then last week, Tony talked to us about the lasting happiness of those who mourn. The inside out, upside down, this end up, kingdom living of Jesus. When we looked at the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, we discovered it was all about humility, about poverty in spirit, about inadequacy, the lasting happiness in being willing to admit how completely dependent we are on God. And then last week, with blessed are those who mourn, we saw how God comforts us in our times of sorrow and brokenness. He comforts those who mourn over broken hearts, personal losses, and personal failures. And how when we are broken over our sin, we are cared for, we are comforted in God's this end up kingdom. And our third beatitude this morning is kind of a byproduct of those first two, a byproduct of admission of inadequacy and dependent upon God and brokenness. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 5, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Meek. Blessed are the meek. You're not going to get a whole lot of resounding support in our culture if you go around touting the qualities of meekness. We just don't view it as a positive or an uplifting or a commanding word. I mean, you don't hear that classic Marine slogan, looking for a few meek men. <laughs> or, or what about resume writing? I'm a self-starter. I'm goal-oriented. I'm there's cross-platform versatile. I am meek. Maybe the response, well, good, because it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world around here. If you want to get ahead in this marketplace, you've got to be meek. Yeah, well, you don't hear that. Meek has evolved to be that word that no gritty American male would ever want to be called, right? Somehow it has this connotation of the stereotypically skinny, fair-skinned guys in those old Archie cartoons with the bad posture and the weak, timid voice. Meek is somehow associated with a lack of strength and cowardice. A story is told of um, this young, handsome, self-absorbed muscle man who shows up on a construction site. And he starts bragging to all the seasoned workers on and on about how strong he is, claiming he could do, outdo any of them there in any feat of strength, and then making fun of them for not taking him up on his challenge. He's really just laying into them, saying they're cowards, saying they're weak. They could never match his trained, refined, brute strength, just laying it on, really rubbing it in and daring anyone to challenge him. After a while of this, one of the quiet older workers who'd been repeatedly hauling concrete and wheelbarrows through the whole affair, he'd had enough. He says, why don't you put your money where your mouth is, pretty boy? I get a week's pay that says I can haul a load in this wheelbarrow down to that supply shed that you can't haul back. You're on, old man, the young bragger eagerly responded. Let's see what you got. Load up your wheelbarrow. The old worker gave him a sly grin and just said, get in. We all know that strength isn't just physical brawn, right? Because strength, like so many words, it's not just a one-dimensional thing. It means just way more than simply who can win in an arm wrestling contest. But even beyond that, words have biographies. They have histories, just like we do, just like families and nations do. In modern English language, just here's a quick culling of phrases pulled from definitions most used in dictionaries. Meekness has come to mean things like soft, Sheepish, lacking courage, timid, overly submissive, a weak spirit. It's like, if you can imagine the persona of Beaker on the Muppets, even along with the little noise he makes, he's meek, that's meek, that noise is called a meek. That's how we think of the word. But that's not what the word has always meant. There's a history there. And it's definitely not the meaning of the word Jesus used when he spoke to the crowds gathered on the hillside that day. Look at this. I can't think of a better way to illustrate it than this. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The word that's translated gentle there. Same word. Same word that was translated meek in the Sermon on the Mount. See, in this, in this Matthew translation, in this verse, 
Many other English translations, especially the older ones, they use the word meek instead of gentle. But because of the connotation that word has developed over generations, our more modern translations use gentle instead of meek. Now, there's lots of adjectives that could be used to describe Jesus. But Jesus himself here chooses the word meek, the same word he uses in our text in Matthew 5, to describe himself. Could anyone assign our modern English association of the word meek to Jesus? Would you describe Jesus as weak-spirited, lacking courage, sheepish, and timid? Historical records of Jesus' life alone tell us he was most certainly nowhere close to that. Jesus went down in history as a revolutionary, a radical catalyst for change, a confronter, a status quo questioner, a lightning rod for accusations, a chain breaker, an activist for the oppressed. He was many, many things, but our modern definitions of meek were not among them. See, this is why it's always important to take a hard look at what the original writer was communicating to the original audience and not just co-opting our modern English association of every word, somehow imagining that God wrote the Bible himself in 21st century English Pittsburghese just for us, okay? Context, culture, and history are important. So I really want us to kind of spend some time letting our modern association of that word, meek, get deprogrammed a bit so we can understand what Jesus is talking about here, all right? The first century uh, Jewish audience hearing Jesus' words would have heard things differently than we do when we read, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now make no mistake, back then, meek wasn't much of a term worth bragging about either, but mainly for men. First century Judea was a masculine culture built on words like strength and power and dominance and authority. But Jesus says this end up. He says that's not where you find joy and meaning and value. And he uses the word meek. But there's something else that first century crowd would have heard. A crowd of the rough, the dispossessed, the marginalized, the diseased, the not quite good enoughs. You see, the whole area around them was ravaged by wars and rumors of wars and uprisings. And many in that audience would have been on the wrong end of those power plays and the maneuvering for political and military control. Many would have felt like life around them was just a perpetual battle for political power and influence, and they were just the beaten down pawns. You also need to know that the word translated for us earth here also meant land, and specifically the land, as in the land promised to Abraham's ancestors, the promised land. When Jews in this first century would use this word, that's how it would very often be heard. That land, the promised land. So Jesus, this end up message to them was revolutionary. They would have heard his message something like this. You see the powerful and the dominant around you battling for political control to take over the land? I tell you, it's not the powerful or the dominant that have claim to that land. It's the meek. That's who gets the inheritance of God's land promised to Abraham. This would have been revolutionary stuff, but it's also consistent with Jesus' upside-down, this-end-up message, a message that actually was never really about physical kingdoms or physical promised lands or physical ancestries and lineage. Jesus is giving glimpses of God's kingdom, of something far different and far better, of lasting happiness. So in the time left, let's dig into this word meek this morning, okay? I want to do my best to kind of describe the fullness of its meaning and its nuance in the first century language and context, okay? And I think we can do that from three angles, all right? Here's the first angle. Meek was the idea of, of raw power, passion, intensity, harnessed or brought under control. Think of a horse. This was actually a common use for this word then. It was a word used where a horse trainer takes a wild bucking horse and is, is able to tame it, to channel that raw strength and power for utility. Have you ever watched a horse run? That's power under control, okay? That's the first angle. Here's another angle of the word meek. It's a purposeful and driven focus on keeping balance despite pressure and weight on every side. Think of the mental and even the physical strength and focus of a tightrope walker. It is an all-body and all-brain feat of, of harnessed strength to make that happen. 
to keep balance, to keep everything centered. Greek philosopher Aristotle would famously say this. He would say, to be meek is to feel anger on the right grounds against the right person in the right manner at the right moment for the right amount of time. (laughs) That is purposeful, driven focus on keeping balance despite pressure and weight on every side, okay? That's, That's that other angle. Here's a final angle, okay? And you're probably going to be starting to see a pattern here. The final angle is meekness as the gentle, cultivated power and steady strength of keeping oneself from being mastered by one extreme or the other. You see the pattern here? If you've had a situation where, say, your teenager ignores your request to pick up their mess for the 98th time, and you try to respond in a way that doesn't attack or overreact, and yet still somehow communicates that that's not okay... If you've ever tried to maintain a healthy diet to trim some pounds and also enjoy really good food, if you've ever tried to cut your own hair and have it be a good-looking haircut, or honesty, if you've ever tried to, to really do your homework and find truth and facts in our news feeds about something as globally affecting as this coronavirus without just being blindly mastered by the talking points on the left or the right, it's hard work. It's incredibly hard work. It's kind of like this passage in 2 Timothy 4.2 that says, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. So there's an important thing in common with these three nuances of meek is they all require incredible strength, resolve, intent, and self-control. I want to say that again. They all require incredible strength, resolve, intent, and self-control. You don't just happen to make your way across the tightrope by sheer luck. You don't find balance between extremes because you randomly ended up there. You see these threads running through all these descriptions. You can see how they're different angles of the same idea. And unlike our definitions of meek at the beginning, I think we can see how much those descriptions of meek sound very much like Jesus since that's the word he uses to describe himself. Meekness is all of those things, all united under the canopy of God's love and leadership. It's like this other verse in 2 Timothy 1.7, where it says, The spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So let's do this together. I want to try and, and kind of flesh out what meekness can look like in our daily rhythms. I want to use our time remaining to just move through a quick list of some ways that we can cultivate meekness in our lives, where Jesus says lasting happiness is found, found in his this end up kingdom. And I think you're going to see how all these are reflected in Jesus' own life. Okay, so here we go. A few quick ideas of ways to cultivate meekness. Number one, submit your impulses and your passions to God's direction. Okay? Okay. Those urges, those impulses, those passions and areas of emotional charge, all of them, the good and the bad, they can be the wild horse that is tamed and channeled and best used by God himself under his lordship. Um, When I was a young kid, young teenager, uh, but all through my life, really, I, I kind of had a history of always being on the move, right? Always bouncing in the chair, always bouncing a leg in the church pew, always fidgeting. My arms and legs were always getting me in trouble. I actually had an extended family member staying at our house for a holiday or something. Uh, One evening, invite me into the guest room where they were staying and pray to cast the demon of hyperactivity out of me. Not a joke. (laughs) Anyway, I was around 13 or 14, and I was really starting to get into the Three Stooges. My family and I were going to a state fair or something, and we're crossing a road with a crowd of people all crossing with us, and I just had this urge to do the curly shuffle. You know, the thing that Curly and the Three Stooges does, kind of this, this backward shuffling motion where your leg heel kicks out. Look it up. You'll find it. Anyway, I had the urge to do the curly shuffle right then and there. It was on my mind, and I just had the urge to do it. Except there was an elderly man walking behind us with his wife. And I went into the curly shuffle, and I felt the heel of my boot connect with his shin. So you have this old guy screaming, jumping around on one leg, holding desperately onto his shin, swearing at me. It was awkward. It was awkward, probably even more awkward for my parents. But I let impulse get the best of me. We need to be willing to let our impulses, our passions, we need to be willing to submit those to God's direction. Maybe it's your passion for hard work 
or your love for debate, or your lustful eyes, or your itchy wallet, or your jealous glances, your tendency to manipulate with guilt trips, or your weakness in addictive patterns, or your anger, or your appetite for incredible food. Whatever it is, those are all things that need to be brought under the canopy of God's direction and lordship. Submit your impulses and passions to God's direction, okay? Even Jesus himself did this. Look at John 6, 38. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do what I want. Meekness acknowledges God as the ultimate authority on all matters of faith and life and relationships, which very much includes submitting our rawness, our impulses, our intensities to his direction, lest we be mastered and ruddered by them, okay? So that's the first one, all right? Here's the, here's the next one. When provoked, refuse to be inflamed by it. When you are provoked, refuse to be inflamed by it. That's how you can cultivate meekness. See, the definition of provocation, of being provoked, is action or speech that makes someone annoyed or angry, especially when it's done deliberately. What gets you on this one? What provokes you? Is it your toddler, your teenager, your coworkers, your spouse? Social media, political discourse about the pandemic? I don't know. What is it for you? When provoked, refuse to be inflamed by it. James 3.17 says this, The wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. That's loaded. That's hard work. And then, of course, this doozy in James 1.19. Let every person be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. See, in the midst of being provoked, the strength of meekness can remain gentle and controlled. This is incredibly hard work. That's strength under control, right? Here's the next one in the list, okay? Don't mistake inconvenience for injustice. Don't mistake inconvenience for injustice. We struggle so much with this as a culture, don't we? Even in these days, we can be some, so, become so con consumed with ways that we feel like our rights or privileges are being stepped on that we begin to think our own version of personal justice is the same as God's. And in so doing, we miss the power of meekness to do its work through setting aside of our rights for the sake of others. There's this passage in the Old Testament where God is speaking to the prophet Habakkuk, describing the self-aggrandizing Babylonians. And God says this in verses 7 and 11 of chapter 1. He says, They are terrible and dreadful. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Guilty men whose own might is their God. That is the opposite of the power and lasting happiness found in meekness. Contrast that passage with the joy of meekness found in this passage in Philippians 2. In humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. That was the way taught and modeled by Jesus. Meekness is cultivated when we realize the difference between inconvenience and true injustice, okay? Next one in our, li excuse me, next one in our list. Learn to disagree without feeling the need to attack. Look at this verse in James 4. <clears throat> what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You see the connection developing here with our impulses and our overestimation of self-justice? You seeing the common thread? We cultivate meekness when we can disagree without instantly taking offense or feeling attacked and by not going on the attack, okay? Learn to disagree without feeling the need to attack. <coughs> Next one in our list. <coughs> Find joy in evidences of God's grace. This is the recognition that we're all in different places, okay? God is working uniquely in each and every one of us. None of us are yet what we will be. 
So learn to rejoice and celebrate in every evidence of progress, in every step towards God's goodness. And part of that is remembering just how much you've been forgiven. So find joy in what God is doing in the lives of others, maybe even especially in the lives of those you tend to be most critical of. Because we all come to the cross stained and sinful and relying on God's grace. Philippians 4.8 Brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. <clears throat> See, when we do that, we cultivate meekness. When we find joy in watching God do his work around us. Sometimes, especially in just those little ways in the thorniest of gardens. Find joy in those evidences of God's grace, okay? And here's the last one on our list this morning, ways to cultivate meekness. Don't be quick to form judgments. Don't be quick to form judgments. I remember when I went to the University of Pittsburgh, on the walk back from one of my classes back to my apartment, there was a homeless guy that I passed by all the time. Saw him regularly on the streets of Oakland. And he often looked like he, in my estimation, had some pretty nice clothes. And one day, I remember this, in my arrogance to rush to judgment this day as I passed, he did his usual thing, held up a sign, and he asked for money. And I retorted to him. I said, your clothes cost more than I have in my bank account. I felt like I had just exacted justice. I felt this sick little surge of self-justification. That same night, my roommates and I had ordered some wings or some fried chicken or something. We had taken the trash to the dumpster out right behind our, our apartment. And later that night, as I closed the blinds before going to bed, I looked through the moonlight reflection and saw that same guy out in the darkness eating all the remaining chicken off the bones that I had just thrown away. That image still haunts me today. Romans 2.1 says, You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. Don't be quick to pass judgments. You see how all these things connect, though? How the power and the strength and courageousness of meekness happens through purposeful control and taming of our impulses, our self-justice, our anger, and our judgments. God's work in our lives tempers those. Author and pastor Colin Smith puts it this way. He says, meekness is the means by which God tames the sinful soul by taming the temper, subduing the assertive self, calming the passions, managing the impulses of the heart, forming a teachable spirit, and bringing order out of chaos in the soul. We can find lasting happiness when we cultivate meekness. And it is intense, hard work. Strength, power, and passions under control and in balance. So our closing question this morning and for our whole series, what kingdom are you living in? We're going to close in communion this morning as we often do, where we remember how Jesus himself, in maybe the ultimate demonstration of meekness, was led to the cross for our sin. Isaiah 53, 7 says this, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. This morning in communion, we remember how our meek Savior used his strength and resolve and obedience to his Father to go to the cross on our behalf. That we might be free from the slavery of sin, that we might be washed clean, might experience the lasting joy of life in God's this end up kingdom. We're going to pray together, and then I invite you to take communion, the bread and the juice, as Jesus' body and blood given up for us. Take that whenever you're ready as we reflect and worship together in a song. So let's pray first, and then take communion at your own pace. Let's pray together. God, this morning, we pray that you would, you would give us that lasting joy of the meekness that your son lived out, that took him to the cross. God, help us to cultivate that strength, that power under control, that careful balance in all our extremes and our tendencies. God, we need your strength and your lordship and your power to do that. To curb the harsh tongue, the rash judgments, the, to think the best of others. 
God, may we never forget the price that was paid for us. May we never forget how much we have been forgiven through the work on the cross, that we might display your grace and your love for others. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take communion together this morning. Thanks so much for joining us this morning at North Hills Christian Church. Be sure and stay connected to emails and all your communication outlets. As these days unfold, whatever things might look like for us as a church and how we might be able to move to a next step as far as any gatherings or things like that, definitely we will keep you posted as we're able to, to make that call, okay? But thanks for joining us on this Mother's Day. Have a great rest of your Sunday.